For this series, we're going to be reading a scene from Macbeth with each episode. And as we read through the scene, I'll be stopping to take questions and add my own two cents and just sort of give some definitions, some context, my own experience directing and teaching the play. When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun, where the place upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. And what's super interesting about these next lines here is they're actually usually cut from most productions, but they're kind of interesting. The first witch says, I come, Grey Malkin. Paddock calls, the third witch says, Anon. And then this very famous line is, Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filth the air. So let's break down this scene a little bit. One of the very interesting things about Shakespeare is he maybe didn't invent, but very much supports the idea in playwriting that you only have a limited amount of time to grab the audience's attention at the beginning of a play. If you don't get their attention in the first 15 minutes or so, you don't really have a chance of ever getting it back. So Shakespeare loves to start his plays off with attention grabbing scenes, whether it be in Romeo and Juliet, where you have the fight or Hamlet, where you have the ghost, or the tempest, where you have the storm. But one of his best attention-grabbing scenes is definitely the witches in Macbeth. So what are these witches? Well, for one thing, it's important to know that Shakespeare's audience would have had a much different relationship with witches than we do today. They wouldn't have been seen as just kind of a spooky part of pop culture, or Halloween. They would have been considered very real, very connected with evil and Satan, and very dangerous. I mean, Macbeth was written probably in the year 1606, and the Salem Witch Trials took place in 1692. Now, obviously, these are different countries, different cultures, but they're pretty closely connected at this time, the settlers in Salem and Shakespeare's audience. So it's quite striking to think that multiple generations had passed since Macbeth and people were still murdering mostly women who they accused of witchcraft. This was perceived as a very real and dangerous threat. That's not to say the witches wouldn't have been seen as fun and exciting or that Shakespeare's audience would have thought the actors were actual witches. Um, just that it would have been a very serious subject matter for them. So what are the witches doing here? Well, first off, they're waiting for an approaching storm, thunder, lightning, or in rain. Maybe the storm's already started. Sometimes you have the sound effects of the storm. But more important than that, there is a battle that's going on currently off stage, And the witches are hanging around the battlefield meeting, and that would have been something quite spooky to Shakespeare's audience. Battles were very hand-to-hand -hand combat, especially Macbeth is set a good 400 years before Shakespeare's lifetime, 500 years. And these battles would have been fought with broadswords, they would have had armor, and if people were injured in battle and left out on the battlefield, people didn't know they were injured or they couldn't move. It was a pretty unfortunate scenario to find oneself in. There was a lot of unsavory criminals and murderers and robbers who would find their way onto a battlefield after the armies had departed and finish off survivors who were injured to strip them of their armor and weapons and possessions. So this would have been a very scary scenario to be in, to be injured and, and to know that this was coming for you. And perhaps even scarier in the world of Macbeth, there's witches who are maybe not interested in armor or weapons but based on later scenes are probably hanging around the battlefield for body parts and organs and different ingredients to throw in their cauldron and create their spells. And of course, they're waiting for Macbeth. So a little bit else about the witches here. I said that these lines about uh, Grey Malkin and Paddock would have been cut from most live productions. That's because those are familiars, which are like spirits in the form of animals that would follow the witches. So you have Paddock would have been a toad and Grey Mulkin would have been a cat. The third witch doesn't have a familiar. But there's a, there's a lot of theories as to what Shakespeare's getting at here. But modern audiences, for the most part, not as interested in this, don't necessarily know what the actors are talking about when they say something like Grey Mulkin and Paddock. And they never come up again in the play. You know, when you're performing Macbeth, it's 
it's still a long show. You got to cut some lines here and there usually. And these are usually the ones that are cut. What's not cut <laughs> is this final line here, fair is foul and foul is fair. And that's a, a big theme in Macbeth, this sort of contradiction or riddles that the witches are speaking in these opposites. You see it earlier when they say, when the battle's lost and won. And even though they're speaking in contradictions, it doesn't seem possible, lost and won. As you read the play, you'll see that you can interpret it as truth. The battle, like all battles, even if it's won, people are, are lost, injured, or killed in it. And this fair is foul and foul is fair. Even if they win the battle, there's still the foulness of, of civil war and the kingdom and betrayal and foreign invasion and all that sort of stuff. And in fact, in a couple of scenes, we'll see Macbeth when he enters echoes the witch's lines right before he sees him. So fair and foul a day I have not seen, which is a direct callback to the witches. So this sort of riddles and contradictions uh, is something to look out for as you read the play. And we shouldn't walk away from the witches without also talking about something else with their speech and that's just the way in which they speak so if you know anything about shakespeare you know that his meter or rhythm when he's writing in verse poetry tends to be iambic specifically iambic pentameter an easy example of that would be romeo and juliet romeo's line but soft what light through yonder window breaks if you were to slow that down and listen to the syllable count you have but soft what light through yon win do breaks and you can see it's an unstressed but soft stressed pattern but soft what light through yon do win do breaks and obviously that's not how an actor reads those lines but it is built into the language this sort of almost heartbeat like meter and shakespeare's plays are filled with iambic pentameter and so is macbeth but not when the witches are on stage. The witches don't speak in iams, they speak in trochase, which is the opposite meter. So if iambic is unstressed, stressed, a troche is stressed, unstressed. So fair is foul and foul is fair is a great example. You read it as fair is foul and foul is fair. You would never read it, at least not naturally, as fair is foul and foul is fair. That would be if you read it iambically, but we don't. We, we read it trochaically, and it's also short a little bit on syllables. Usually the witches are speaking in um, tetrameter, which is four sets of um, pairs, so eight syllables, as opposed to pentameter, five, five sets, ten syllables. I just find this very interesting and just a brilliant move on Shakespeare's part uh, that the witches almost speak backwards rhythmically from the rest of the characters. You know, even in recent times people have you know had satanic scares about rock bands albums being played backwards and having hidden messages in them there's something that sort of creeps us out about something being played backwards and the fact that the witches have this sort of backwards rhythm to their speech just i think is such great character development on the syllable level of their lines um, so something to look for and in fact sometimes Shakespearean actors will struggle a little bit memorizing the witch's lines at first, even though there's not a ton of lines because they're backwards from what they're used to, trochees instead of iams. It does feel quite unnatural. It's a very harsh sounding uh, word. You think of a word like liver is um, trochaic, and a lot of trochaic words sort of have a harsher feel to them. Um, and with that said, I think that's all I have to say about Act One, Scene One. So it starts with Duncan, who is the king. This is our first time meeting him. He says, what bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt, the newest state. So if you're picturing the scene, Duncan is on stage and he sees this man out in the distance who's injured. He's uh, the captain that we'll see in a couple of lines here. And the captain, because he's injured, Duncan knows he's been part of this battle. Now, in the previous scene, the witches said they were going to meet with Macbeth after the battle was lost or won. So this is the battle. And as we read, we'll get a, a greater picture of what's happening in this battle and what sort of stakes there are and who the heroes and villains are, so to speak. Malcolm is Duncan's eldest son. He replies, this is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. 
Say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. Some interesting things here with Malcolm's introduction. He knows this sergeant or captain because he, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against his captivity. So Malcolm would have been captured had it not been for this captain who got injured in the process. And what's really uh, interesting about this is it, it gives us a first look at Malcolm and we can see that he's maybe not the greatest uh, soldier, at least not right now. There's a, a Globe production of this scene where uh, the injured captain reaches up for Malcolm's hand and Malcolm, who's dressed very fine and fancy, says like, oh, no, 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 and points to one of his servants to pick him up instead. But if Malcolm, who is, you know, the king's son, had been captured, that could have been the end of the battle. So we get in his introduction, he's not a great fighter. Okay, now to the captain. He says, doubtful it, it being the battle, stood as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. So Shakespeare loves to use similes to compare things, and here he's comparing the two armies in this battle to two swimmers who are exhausted, they're spent, and they cling on to each other, and in doing so, they choke their art. Art here means skill. Their skill, of course, is being swimmers. So because they're both exhausted and holding on to each other, they're drowning one another. So to translate that simile, these armies are both losing. Um, they're both like spent swimmers that are just destroying one another. No one's really winning. The merciless MacDonwald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of Kearns and Gallo Glasses is supplied. So we find out that one of the people Duncan is fighting against is MacDonwald, who is a thane, uh, specifically a thane of Cawdor. And he has some soldiers from West Scotland, maybe even from Ireland, that Gallo Glasses, probably referring to uh, people from the Irish area, uh, who are helping to try and overthrow Duncan. So this is a civil war. And Fortune, so Fortune is being personified here, fate, destiny. Fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. So that's some not nice words for fortune, right? The captain does not think very highly of fortune and the favor it's showing the rebel forces. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. So we find out Macbeth, his very first introduction is, well, not his first, the witches talk about him. But the first time he's talked about in front of the king, he's brave. Uh, disdaining fortune, so going against fortune, with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution like valor's minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the knave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. So that is quite a description of Macbeth. Basically, he cuts his way through the opposing lines till he faces the rebel himself and he unseams him from the nave so navel would be like your belly button area to the chops which would be your jaw so cuts him open and then takes his head off and fixes it upon their battlements which would probably be a spear or a flag it's a pretty brutal description and of course this character is injured he would be you know muddy and bloody and um you know not doing super well well enough to speak all these lines. But um, we're seeing a very close-up of the battle, but we're getting a sense of the brutality of it. Duncan says, Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. Now Macbeth's not necessarily his cousin. That just means kinsman. So someone he's close to. As whence the sun gains his, re gains his reflection, shipwracking storms and direful thunders break. So from that spring, whence comforts seem to come, discomfort swells. So even though Macbeth was helping Duncan's forces win the battle, a new discomfort is upon them, a new storm. He says, Mark, King of Scotland, Mark, no sooner justice had with valor armed compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. So now we know that Duncan is not just fighting against MacDonwald and the rebel forces in Scotland, but also an external threat with the king of Norway. So the Norwegian lord surveying vantage means he sees 
his opportunity and he begins a fresh assault. They just survived this battle and now there's a brand new one. Duncan says, dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo is another thane of Scotland, so he'd be leading another set of forces. And uh, oftentimes he's played as like Macbeth's best friend and his fellow brother in arms. So Duncan's asking, did this worry them? And the captain says, yes, is sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. So this is where Shakespeare gets super confusing because the question is, did this worry Macbeth and Banquo? The captain says, yes, but you have to read carefully to see that this is actually sarcasm as sparrows worry eagles or the hare worries the lion, which obviously sparrows do not worry eagles and rabbits do not worry lions. So Macbeth and Banquo are not worried by this fresh assault. If I say sooth, I must, which is like truth, I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks. So cannons that have double the explosives in them. So they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. So you know, very dangerous and attack the foe again. Except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha. I cannot tell. So he's not sure what like is happening in the battle, but he gives us this image of memorizing, meaning memorializing another Golgotha. And Golgotha in the Bible is the place where Jesus is crucified. And it means the place of dead men's skulls, a place of violence and death, but also salvation. So Macbeth helps win the battle. Then we see this dash. I cannot tell dash. He cuts himself off. That's what a dash means in theater. He says, but I am faint. My gashes cry for help, Duncan. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Go get him surgeons. And the captain is led off by the attendants. In some creepier productions of Macbeth, sometimes something else happens to the captain involving the witches. That's kind of a, not a popular, but a, a creative solution to getting the captain off stage is maybe the witches are there in the background or something. Anyway, enter Ross and Angus, who are also soldiers and, and higher ups in Duncan's forces. Who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross. Lennox, what a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence camest thou, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. So in Fife, which is another section of Scotland, Norway is winning. Norway himself with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, which is MacDonald, began a dismal conflict till that Bologna's bridegroom. So Bologna is the Roman goddess of war. And her bridegroom would be like her fiercest, strongest warrior. And this is Macbeth. He is like the bridegroom, the, um, the person marrying the god of, goddess of war. Uh, anyway, till that Bologna's bridegroom lapped in proof, confronted him with self-compassions. Point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curving his lavish spirit. And to conclude, the victory fell on us. So the whole battle is done. It all takes place off stage, but we get little glimpses of it and little kind of news flashes, which puts us right kind of in the king's shoes. It is also worth noting that it's hard to show a battle on stage in live theater, especially at Shakespeare's time. So having these little snippets of it works a lot better. By the end of the play, we will see a battle that happens on stage and it's very fast and there's lots of people involved and lots of sword fights. But for this part, we're just getting a description of Macbeth and him winning the battle. Duncan says, great happiness that now Sweno, the Norway's king, so this is the king of Norway, craves composition, meaning like um, terms of surrender or a, maybe a truce even. Nor would we deny him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Colney's Inch $10,000 to our general use. And it's it's actually Colum's, not Colney's, I read that wrong, St. Colum's inch, which is just a, a part of Scotland. It's a little island in Scotland. Um, and basically, Norway's paying them, so more good news because Norway lost. Duncan says, no more that Thane of Cawdor, so no more will that Thane of Cawdor is how you could read it. No more that Thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom, meaning heart's interest, 
go pronounce his present death. So the Thane of Cawdor, McDonwald, who was uh, the rebel, is going to be pronounced dead, or the rebels themselves are going to die, and the Thane of Cawdor is included in them. And this is the very, very important part of this scene. Go pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. So Macbeth, who is already a Thane, he's the Thane of Gloms, is now also going to be named Thane of Cawdor, since he defeated the Thane of Cawdor who had been rebelling against Duncan. So that's really important information to carry into the next scene. Uh, Ross says, I'll see it done. Duncan, what he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. It starts with the witches again. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine, sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, a roint the witch, the rump fed runyon cries. So in this first part, the witches meet up and they're talking about where they've been. And the first witch tells us that she comes across a sailor's wife who's eating chestnuts and she asks for some of the chestnuts. And the, the wife of this sailor basically says, get out of here. And then the witch says something, you know, not too nice about her uh, and about her diet, I suppose, being rump fed. Anyway, here's what the witch is going to do about it. And it gives us a lot of character about the witches. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger, which is the boat that he has, the ship. But in a sieve, I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. So here we have the first little hint at the witch's power because she's sailing in a sieve, which is something that lets water through it, right? You use it to like drain you no know, noodles or pasta or something. So the fact that she can sail on it shows that they can manipulate the physical world or the elements of the physical world. The second witch follows this up with, I'll give thee a wind, thou art kind, and I another. I myself have all the other and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know, I and the shipman's card. Card here means the shipman's compass. So basically everywhere they're going, she's going to control the compass. I'll drain him dry as hay, which means to make him exhausted. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid, which is eyelids. He shall live a man forbid Weary seven nights, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak, and pine. So live a man forbid means a man cursed under a curse. And basically, he's not going to be able to sleep. And also, the boat's going to be controlled, so they can't bring it to port. Though his bark, which is a ship, cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed, which is a storm. So very interesting here. We get a lot about the witches. We figure out what they can control, like the wind and uh, the waves and the magnetic field of the compass, that they can keep someone awake against their will, which as you continue to read on with the play, you'll see how someone being sleep-deprived is a pretty big deal. And then finally, she changes subjects and says, look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb racked as homeward he did come. So apparently she's done this to someone else before, and now she has a severed thumb from whoever she did this to previously. In some productions, the thumb is used as lipstick, which is a very creepy touch. In other productions, it's just a thumb, which is creepy enough on its own. But reminder, she's doing all of this because a woman wouldn't share her chestnuts. So yeah, pretty... Uh, dastardly figures here, the three witches. Anyway, we hear a drum off stage. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. And of course, this is who they've been on the lookout for. The weird sisters hand in hand. So weird here, it, I'm pronouncing it a little weirdly because it doesn't mean weird like strange. It's a, a Scottish variation on an old English word. And basically it means those who control the fates. Posters of the sea and land, so people who travel across like the postman. Posters of the sea and land, thus do go about, about, thrice to thine and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. And here we mean the charm or the curse or the, the trap uh, is wound up like a, a spring that's about to um go off when it's supposed to go off. And... As you can probably tell, Macbeth is the subject of their trap. Macbeth and Banquo enter our first time hearing our title character. So foul and fair a day I have not seen, right? He just got done with battle. 
foul and fair they won, but at what cost? Probably a great cost. How far is it to fours? And then Banquo sees the weird sisters. What are these? So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on it. So then speaking to them, you see the dash interrupts, so changing tone. Live you or are you not that man may question? You seem to understand me by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. So this is stage direction. We're told through Banquo's line that the witches are laying a finger across their lips, which is usually interpreted as like, be quiet um, because they're not here for Banquo. They're here for Macbeth. You should be women. And yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. So here we have a description of them. And this usually isn't done Nowadays, uh, the witches are usually played by women, but in Shakespeare's time, they would have been played by men. So having the men keep their beards while playing women would have added to sort of the differentness of the witches from the rest of the characters. Speak if you can, what are you? So notice Macbeth barely talks compared to Banquo, but the witches answer Macbeth. All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Gloms. And Thane is like a person in charge of a smaller section of the country. You could think of it like a maybe a duke or a, a governor, although it doesn't quite line up with modern politics, but basically someone who has some land and some power. And Macbeth is the Thane of Gloms. All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Gloms. All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail Macbeth, that shalt be king hereafter. So here Macbeth doesn't answer and we get his reaction again through Banquo's lines. He says to Macbeth, good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? And then he turns to the witches. In the name of truth, are you fantastical or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. Wrapped means sort of transported or like your mind's totally gone, your mind's transported. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. So Banquo's like, hey, if you can predict things, why don't you predict something for me? Because I don't really care what you have to say. The witches talk to Banquo finally. Hail, 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 lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth all hail. The prophecy, or I guess prediction for Macbeth, is pretty straightforward. It's his present title, Thane of Gloms. It's a different title, owned by someone else, Thane of Cawdor. And then it's this ultimate prediction of being king, eventually. Whereas Banquo's a little bit harder to figure out, not so happy yet much happier, lesser than Macbeth and greater. So we have these contradictions which go all the way back to, you know, that first scene with the witches where they say we'll meet when the battle's lost or won and that fair is foul and foul is fair. And this final one, the third witch's prediction, thou shalt get kings though thou be none. That one we can put a little more meaning to. It means you will be the father of kings, but you yourself will not be a king. So still confusing, but you can make a little more sense of it than the previous ones. They start to exit the stage, the witches. Stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. By Sinnel's death, that's his father, Macbeth's father, Sinnel. By Sinnel's death, I know I am Thane of Gloms, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, I charge you, but the witches exit. And in fact, they vanish in the script. Banquo comments on this. The earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air. And what seemed corporal, which means human, melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed? Were such things here as we do speak about, or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? So Banquo's like, did we actually just see what we, we think we saw, or did we like eat some bad vegetables or something that uh, is driving us crazy here? Macbeth responds to Banquo, your children shall be kings, you shall be king. And Thane of Cawdor too, went it not so. 
to the self same tune and words who's there so then we have another group enter uh ross and angus and they're also in the scottish army they've been fighting for duncan uh ross and angus enter ross says the king hath happily received macbeth the news of thy success and when he reads thy personal venture in the rebels fight his wonders and his praises do contend which should be thine or his Silenced with that, and viewing o'er the rest of the self same day, he finds thee and the stout Norwegian ranks, nothing afeard of what thyself didst make, strange images of death, as thick as tail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense, and poured them down before him. So Ross is basically saying the king has heard all about what you did, Macbeth and Banquo, especially Macbeth, that's who's addressed here. And uh, every report speaks of your valor and that you uh, charged into death itself and helped defeat the rebels. And, and then Angus has the real specific thing here. He says, we are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. So here we have issue or order for Macbeth to go see Duncan. And then we have this very interesting detail that you definitely want to pick up on. Ross says, and for an earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call the Thane of Cawdor, and which addition hail most worthy Thane, for it is thine. So this is when all of a sudden what the witches said to Macbeth has some measure of validity or chance of being correct, right? They greeted him with his title, which is weird, you know, Thane of Gloms, because he doesn't know them. So why would they know he's Thane of Gloms? But, you know, you can figure things out even in the pre-internet age, I'm sure. But then they greeted him with Thane of Cawdor, which is not his title. But here, just a few lines later, Macbeth is told that he is now the Thane of Cawdor and the Thane of Gloms, which immediately makes what the witches said seem plausible. And of course, the third thing they said was he will be king. Banquo says, what can the devil speak true? And here the devil is, of course, referring to the witches. The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Meaning, like, why am I the thing of someone else is the thing of Cawdor? Who was the thing lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose, whether he was combined with those of Norway or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he labored in his country's rack. I know not, but treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Angus doesn't know why the Thane of Cawdor is being killed, but he was either with the rebels or he was uh, with Norway, but whatever, it doesn't matter. He committed treason and the cost of treason is death. So the Thane of Cawdor is being executed and his title, his land, his castle, all of that is going to go to Macbeth as a reward for the great service he did in battle. Macbeth has an aside, which means it's just to a specific character, or in this instance, just to us, the audience. Gloms and Thane of Cawdor, the greatest is behind, and is behind means is to come, like following up, and the greatest would of course be being king. To Ross and Angus, thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings? To Banquo. When those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promise no less to them. Right, so he's asking Banquo, this, like, this is coming true. And Banquo has a very important answer. He says, that trusted home, means trusted fully, trusted home, might yet enkindle you unto the crown besides the Thane of Cawdor. But tis strange. And oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betrays in deepest consequence. Betray us in deepest consequence. So what Banquo is saying there is that the forces of evil, the witches in this instance, can use truth to destroy us. And this is very reminiscent of another Shakespearean line, a more famous one, which is from The Merchant of Venice, Act 1, Scene 3, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. So you've probably heard a variation on that. You know, even the devil can cite scripture, basically meaning just because someone says the truth doesn't mean they're speaking with good intentions. Evil can use truth to destroy us. So here we have a direct warning from Banquo. He says, cousins, a word I pray you, which is to Ross and Angus. So they step aside to another part of the stage. Macbeth is kind of alone. 
in his little corner and he has an aside to us the audience and to himself two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme the two truths being thane of cawdor thane of glom's imperial theme he's going to be king according to the witches i thank you gentlemen so back to them this supernatural soliciting cannot be ill cannot be good if ill why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth so he's basically saying what the witches said, it can't be bad and it can't be good, which is very fitting because the witches speak in contradiction all the time. So if it's bad, how come it commenced in a truth and that I was success in getting this new thingdom? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? So he's saying if this is a good prediction why am i so scared of it why is my heart knocking against my ribs present fears are less than horrible imaginings meaning he's scared of what he's even imagining this could mean my thought whose murder important choice of words my thought whose murder yet is but fantastical shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise Function is the ability to act and surmise is speculation. He's basically been almost uh, petrified by this, that he can't even think of what he should do or what he would do. He's scared to think of what he would do because, you know, to be very clear here, the witch is predicted that he will be king. There is already someone who's king. His name is Duncan. Macbeth just cut a man open and charged the enemy lines to save Duncan and his rulership. He's a war hero. And now someone's suggesting that he could be king, but Duncan is king and he's alive and well. Anyway, and nothing is but what is not. Banquo to the others says, look how our partners wrapped. Macbeth aside, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. So here's his little moment of hope uh, for whoever's playing Macbeth, the actor. This is your moment of hope, right? I'm scared to think of becoming king through illegitimate means, but... If fate, chance, says I'm going to be king, maybe fate will make me king without me having to do anything, which is a win-win, right? He just becomes king somehow, and he doesn't have to do anything about it. Uh, doesn't have to do anything wrong, at least. Banquo says, new honors come upon him like our strange garments cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of use. So basically, like, he must just be confused because, you know, he has a new, a new title. He's taking it all in. Come what come may. Time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Banquo calls to him, Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Uh, give me your favor. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. And then aside to Banquo, as the others walk off, Think upon what hath chanced, and at more time, the interim having weighed it, let us speak our free hearts to each other very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friends. So basically, Macbeth says, when we get a chance to talk about this, let's, because this is crazy. But for now, let's keep this little secret to ourselves. Duncan starts us off the king. Is execution done on Cawdor? Are not those in commission yet returned? So those in commission means those in charge of it. And the execution is because the previous Thane of Cawdor was treasonous and therefore has been sentenced to execution, the cost of treason. Now his title has been given to Macbeth. We as the audience know this. The witches seem to know this, but Macbeth, well, Macbeth has found out as well. He hasn't officially got word from the king yet. Malcolm says, my liege, they are not yet come back. But I've spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that, very frankly, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. So this is the previous thing of Cawdor, who was just executed. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as twere a careless trifle. Malcolm really humanizes the Thane of Cawdor here. He talks about how he, he confessed, he implored or asked for Duncan's pardon for his crime and that he had a deep repentance, almost like the best thing he ever did in life was lose it. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. And what this kind of shows is that Malcolm 
maybe is not really cut out for the the brutality of what it means to be king at this time. Um, I'm not saying that the kings should have been brutal, but they certainly were, and it was it was a brutal world. We saw what the battle happened at the beginning, and had the Thane of Cawdor and those in rebellion succeeded, it would have been the royal family who would have been killed. And here we see Malcolm sort of question, was it the right thing to execute him? Duncan responds, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Here, art means skill. So there's no skill to find or read the mind's thoughts in the mind's thoughts in the face. Basically saying just because someone looks like they're sorry or looks like they're remorseful doesn't mean that they actually are internally. And this is a theme that will come up literally a dozen times in this play, and it's always worth watching for. This idea that what's happening in your mind or in your heart does not have to match what's happening in your face. Kind of more uh, exclusive to humans, right? An animal, when it's upset, it, it looks upset. It looks angry. But with humans, we can look incredibly pleasant and happy to see you, but on the inside be hating your guts. Anyway, he was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Enter Banquo, Macbeth, Ross, and Angus. A worthiest cousin, the sin of my ingratitude even now is heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. So basically, those were a whole lot of lines talking about how thankful Duncan is for what these people did to save his kingdom and save his life. And usually these lines are directed at Macbeth specifically, even though there are multiple people in the room. And of course, this sets Macbeth's hopes up, right? Duncan literally says, I, I can't even begin to pay you for everything that you did. You are so, so incredible that the that recompense, thankfulness cannot overtake thee or is slow to overtake thee. I wish I could have repaid you for what you did sooner, but now we'll have to, um, we'll have to do. And Macbeth, since he talked to the witches, is obviously hoping that he'll be named king. And it's worth noting that at this time in Scotland, you do not need to, or traditionally, you did not have to name your son, your firstborn son, as the next ruler of the kingdom. It was oftentimes passed down through hereditary means like that, but it didn't have to be. It could be just someone seemed like they would be a great ruler, so you would name them king. And that has to be what Macbeth is thinking that Duncan is going to talk about next. Macbeth says, the service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. So being very humble, right? Your highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. So basically saying we are children or servants to you. Um, it is our job to do everything we can for you, regardless of whether or not you're going to repay us. Welcome hither, welcome here. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. So again, to imply that there's future rewards for Macbeth. Then he turns to Banquo. Noble Banquo, that hast no less deserved, nor must be known no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. Basically, let me give you a hug. So some stage direction there. Banquo says, there, if I grow, the harvest is your own. Meaning like if I intend, if I um, get greater in my future endeavors, it's because of what you've done for me. So these are all just being very polite, right? They're, they're in a polite mood. Duncan's so grateful. Banquo and Macbeth are like, ah, no, you know, like we, we did it because it's our job. You know, you don't even have to thank us when they both have these prophecies of being king and the father of kings, and especially Macbeth's is very much weighing on his mind because the second prophecy has already come true. He was Thane of Gloms. He's now been named Thane of Cawdor. He must be thinking that logically the third prediction or prophecy thou shalt be king hereafter will come true as well. So here's the big line from Duncan. He says, my plenteous joys, wanton and fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Basically, he's so happy he's crying. It looks like he's sorrowful, but he's full of joy. He says to the whole room, sons, kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest, big line, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest Malcolm, 
whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland. So basically, Duncan brings everyone together and says, oh, by the way, the next ruler of Scotland is going to be Malcolm. Now, Duncan's usually played by someone older, right? Someone who would be old enough to have sons in their late teens, early to mid 20s. So someone who's like 40, 50 plus, 60 even. The idea being that Macbeth must think Duncan's not going to be king forever. Uh, Macbeth's usually played by like a 30 year old. Duncan's not going to be king forever. I have a chance of just being named the next king. He says that uh, chance uh, predicted I'll be king. Maybe chance will make me king without me having to do anything about it. And now that chance is gone. Malcolm's been named king. Malcolm's at least five, if not 10 years younger than Macbeth. So Macbeth's chance at the throne has evaporated. And what's more so, Shakespeare has shown us that Malcolm is not set to be a good ruler. At the beginning of the battle, he nearly loses it for everyone because he's almost captured. A captain has to suffer great bodily harm to save him, while Macbeth charges through the lines and almost single-handedly with Banquo, at least, wins the battle or turns the tide of battle. And then at the beginning, we see that Malcolm just maybe doesn't have the brutality uh, required to be king. And again, I don't think you should necessarily be executing people, but it's it says something that Malcolm seems so easily swayed by the former Thane of Cawdor's admission of guilt. And uh, despite all of that, he's been named Prince of Cumberland, the next in line for the throne. He says of this, uh, Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers meaning everyone who's here, if you stick with Malcolm, great things are going to happen to you too. This honor is not just going to go along with Malcolm, it's going to go along with everyone here. I want to put this in just a modern example here. Let's say uh, Macbeth is an employee at a huge company and he gets called in uh, by the CEO and two things happen. One, his salary is doubled. That would be a big deal right? That's basically what happened when he became an, another thane, not just Gloms, but also Cawdor. His wealth doubled. And two, he's in the room when the future CEO is named. And the current CEO says, oh, by the way, if you stick with this guy, the five of you in this room, great things are going to happen to you. That would be an incredible day for anyone's career right? Like a doubled salary and being brought into the inner circle of the top of the company. That's basically what's happened to Macbeth today. But because of the temptation and because of the promise that the witches have planted in his brain simply by saying, you shall be king, he chalks it up as a, as a horrible day. Because in his mind, he, he doesn't have the chance of promotion. He'll never be king now, at least not through legitimate means. So therefore, it's, it's horrible, but I, I think perspective is so important here, and it shows just how dangerous the witch's words are because they take what should be great news and twist it into horrible news that he would have to be ruled by an inferior person who's been appointed purely because of nepotism as opposed to earning the right to the throne or something like that. At least that's what Macbeth's thinking. But there's more to Duncan's line. He says, from hence to Inverness and bind us further to you. Now, this is really important to know. Inverness is Macbeth's castle. So, oh, by the way, we're all going to stay at your place tonight, Macbeth. Now, Macbeth, knows he can't be king through legitimate means and all of a sudden the royal family is staying at his place this would happen from time to time it's dangerous to travel at night so my thought is that probably Macbeth's castle is the closest so let's go stay there and when you're the king you can stay wherever you want probably so anyway they're all going to Macbeth's castle the rest is labor which is not used for you I'll be myself the harbinger which is someone who runs ahead with letting people know that other people are coming right like the greeter messenger paves the way i guess i'll be the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach so humbly take my leave like i got to get home tell people that um you know we're gonna host the royal family tonight um, i'm sure my wife's gonna want to know about that so i'll go on ahead and macbeth starts to leave the room duncan says my worthy cawdor is like a farewell right pointing out hey you've been promoted i hope you're happy and Macbeth has a very important aside. So this is just his own thoughts to us. No one else in the room hears this. He says, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap. 
or in my way it lies. So this is the first of many like horse riding metaphors and images that are used in the play, oftentimes for Macbeth. He's considered a great horseman, equestrian, uh, rider of horses. I don't know what the term is, but that probably goes along with being a great warrior and kind of shows that he's just manly and macho and, and good at things. Um, so he's going to ride on ahead and he uses that idea as a, a metaphor that says, the Prince of Cumberland, Malcolm, I'm either, it's a step, it's a barrier. And I either need to fall down, which means never become king or leap over it which means somehow get the throne before Malcolm or from Malcolm, which you can probably guess there's not a lot of legitimate ways to do that. And then he says one of the most famous lines we've heard so far in the whole play, stars, hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. So stars would be the heavens, almost God, don't look at what's in my mind right now because it is, it's not good. He doesn't say it out loud. But his thought is the only way to get this throne is to take it. And the only way to take a throne is through killing the previous king. So we see the person who saved the kingdom at the beginning of the show have his first sort of thoughts about possibly killing the person he just saved in order to take the throne. He says the eye wink at the hand, meaning like you would close your eyes, right? So the eye won't see what the hand does. Yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. So again, he hasn't necessarily said anything out loud to other people, just to us, but it's a scary thought. And I'd be willing to say that even in um, the most extreme, like reactionary scenarios, most of what we do wrong, we, we do wrong in our minds before we do it wrong in real life. We think about doing it whether or not. And now obviously there's a difference between something that's premeditated according to the law, and something that happens in like the passion of the moment. But again, I'd say 99% of the time, the thought has to at least cross the mind before the body acts on it. And uh, it, it's dangerous, the thought that Macbeth is having here. He exits, Duncan says, true worthy Banquo. So he's probably talking to Banquo in the back of the stage. True worthy Banquo, he is full, so valiant. And in his commendations, I am fed. It is a banquet to me. This is probably talking about Macbeth. Let's after him, whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. So the end of the scene, we see that Banquo, Duncan, Malcolm, Donald Bain, who's Mal uh, Duncan's other son, and the whole royal company are coming to Macbeth's castle in order to stay the night there. And Macbeth has to run on ahead and let his wife know. His wife is Lady Macbeth. And she is perhaps the most infamous female character in all of Shakespeare. It's a, it's a big role. So very excited to dive into Lady Macbeth's lines next scene. I know this was a short scene, but we have some pretty important stuff in it. Not the least of which is news that Malcolm is going to be the future king. And uh, Macbeth is incredibly disappointed, to say the least, about that decision. <laughs> Okay, Lady Macbeth enters the stage alone, reading a letter. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report, they have more in them than mortal knowledge. So the they is the witches, and this is a letter from Macbeth. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. While I stood, wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail king that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. So a couple important things to point out about this letter. First off, practically speaking, it gives us a good recap of what's happened so far in the play. And Shakespeare does this every once in a while, probably because his audience wouldn't have had like watches or phones, obviously. So chances are you might show up to a play a little late and here's a good chance to get, you know, a recap. Also, a lot of Shakespeare's audience wouldn't have had the opportunity to go to school a lot. They might not have been literate. Uh, they might not have an education, a formal education at all, or might've stopped in fourth grade or eighth grade equivalent. So just like us, Shakespeare's original audience would have struggled from time to time to understand what he was saying. 
and having it repeated is a great way to catch up. So that's sort of in a practical sense. In terms of the story, there's also some really big things happening here. Two things I want to point out. First is the title that Macbeth gives Lady Macbeth in the letter. He calls her his dearest partner of greatness. Now I'm married, so I understand, you know, calling your spouse by something other than their name. You don't always use their name, but usually you would call them love or honey or sweetheart or something like that. You usually wouldn't call them partner of greatness. So I think this shows where the Macbeth's ambition lies. And we'll see that word show up in this scene. It'll be a word that shows up a lot and is one of the main themes of the play, ambition and the, the danger of ambition. So the other thing I want to point out is the timing of this letter. Lady Macbeth reads this letter from Macbeth. So obviously he had to have written it in the past. So when did he write it? Well, he talks about in here, while well, I stood wrapped in wonder of it, came missives from the king who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor. So that's the first scene that Macbeth is in. I believe that's 1-3. If I, yes, 1-3. So the end of 1-3, Ross and Angus enter, and they tell Macbeth he's Thane of Cawdor. And then he writes this letter. So he writes about what the witches said to him, and he writes about the second greeting, the second prophecy, uh, Thane of Cawdor coming true. And of course, is excited about the third prophecy coming true. What Lady Macbeth doesn't know is that since he wrote this letter, he's seen Duncan and not been awarded the crown, but that Malcolm has been named heir to the throne. So Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are in two different places with this. Lady Macbeth is still full of hope that this will come true, him becoming king, whereas Macbeth is more resolved that this is trickier than it might appear on the surface. Lady Macbeth goes on now, no longer reading the letter, but using her own words. Gloms thou art and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet I do fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldest be great, art not without ambition, keyword but without the illness should attend it. And here illness means ruthfulness. So Macbeth has ambition, she says, but he doesn't have the ruthlessness to take what he wants. What thou wouldest highly, so what thou would want greatly, thou wouldest holily, like holy. Basically, what you want, Macbeth, you also want to get fairly. And Lady Macbeth's point is that to get what you want in life, you can't play by the rules. You have to take it. You can't wait for it to be given to you. Wouldest not play false, and yet wouldest wrongly win. Thou dost have great gloms, that which cries, Thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. So that's a very confusing sentence. And part of the reason why that's so confusing is that Lady Macbeth is using really ambiguous language. She doesn't say murder. She doesn't say assassinate. She doesn't say kill the king. She says it and that and wouldest have. So her language is, you know, scary, but it's, it's guarded still. She's not outright saying that you should murder the king. She's more of hypothesizing about Macbeth's character than putting a plan of action into place. And I think that's a very important distinction. Hi thee hither, so here's where she does have some, some action. Hi thee hither, basically come here. Hi thee hither, that, I'm, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. The golden round would be a crown and uh, fate and metaphysical aid would be what's happened and what the witches predicted, that he is Thane of Cawdor. So it seems like both are guiding him toward the crown. And basically, hi thee hither that I may pour my spirits in thine ear means when you get here, I'm going to convince you to do what it takes to become the next king. So all of this is interrupted by a messenger who enters and uh, she says, what is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it, is not thy master with him? Who wert so would have informed for preparation? So she's pretty upset, right? Like, is not thy master, meaning Macbeth, is not Macbeth, like, how, why am I just finding out about this right now? That the king is coming to our castle and we're expected to host him. That'd be a big deal, right? You got to put away laundry and, you know, make some food and stuff. But beyond that, all of a sudden, what Lady Macbeth was talking about hypothetically is now something that can happen for real, 
like in reality. It's one thing to say that they should take the crown from Duncan. It's a whole nother thing for Duncan all of a sudden to be spending his evening there in their castle. So the stakes have been raised, uh, so to speak. So please you, it is true, our Thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. So basically Macbeth was riding his horse really fast, but someone was able to get here and tell us, uh, to give us a bit of a heads up. Lady Macbeth says, give him tending. He brings great news. Messenger exits. So now that the opportunity is present, Lady Macbeth realizes that she needs to call on some help if she wants to take the crown from Duncan. And the help she calls on is from the devil. So this is where Lady Macbeth's words get pretty severe. And I want to point out that a page ago, she could not even say the word murder. You know, now she's she's going to say some words, so to speak. This is a very famous monologue. And we'll explain some of the interesting passages in it, I promise. It starts with a sound effect, which is probably imagined in Shakespeare's time, unless I had a bird somewhere. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. So a raven would have been a bad omen. It's one of those sort of like evil birds in Shakespeare's time. So the fact that she hears a raven and that the raven sounds hoarse is a big implication that something bad is going to happen. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. So that's the confusing line. This is the unsex me here speech or unsex me monologue. And this is a soliloquy, Lady Macbeth's alone on stage, but we're also hearing her thoughts. And um, she's not really talking as much to herself as she's talking to the audience and especially to these spirits. And what does she want these spirits, these spirits of hell, these demons to do? She wants them to unsex her, which means to take off her womanhood. And this is a very confusing passage. And it's very charged language, I know. So I'll do my best to explain it here. So basically in this time, it was not thought that women would be capable of something like murder, at least a, a grisly murder. Now, witches are being put to death all the time and the witches are almost always women. So they were believed to be susceptible to evil, that they could be controlled by the devil, but of their own volition committing something like murder that was unheard of now we of course know nowadays that that's not the case that all people sadly are capable of committing terrible acts but there is something to be said that i think even today we're more surprised in the news when a violent act is carried out by a woman than we are by a man so there is some real carryover from this so basically she wants to throw off her womanhood and instead be filled from the toe to the top so her entire body full of direst cruelty, so pure, darkest, most um, potent cruelty. So take off the parts of womanhood like tenderness and maternal instincts and caring for others and replace it with cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. So thickening her blood and stopping up the passage to remorse, right? So she doesn't feel remorseful for deeds like uh, murder, um, that nothing comes between her purpose and what she wants to do to carry out that purpose. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. So again, interesting language. When she says, come to my women's breasts and take my milk for gall, she means take, you know, what gives people life, especially in a pre-formula day and age, breastfeeding, to replace that with gall, which is like what's in the, the stomach and the liver, like stomach acid. So take the, the nourisher of all life when it's born and replace it with something that destroys. I mean, if you've ever, you know, spat up a little bit, you know that stomach acid is not pleasant, it, it burns, and she wants to fill herself with that instead. So it's it's a very clear metaphor of replacing what makes her, you know, the stereotypical woman at this time with someone who would be evil and capable of carrying out an evil act. 
Come thick night and pale thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, dunnest means darkest, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold, and then Macbeth enters. So that last bit is she she calls on night itself to uh, use the darkest smoke in hell to cover the heavens so the heavens cannot see what her knife is going to do and cry out for her to hold or stop. And that's pretty similar to when Macbeth says, uh, stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. So again, this idea that like, if heaven saw what was happening, it would stop it. Because, you know, especially with a king, they believed kings were divinely put on the throne. They also acknowledge that as humans, we have something like a conscious, uh, where we have remorse and uh, things that keep us from doing terrible acts like that. Common sense, for instance. But she wants all that to be blocked out, basically giving herself into evil. And uh, it's a crazy monologue, but it's phenomenal. I feel a little guilty breaking it up like that, but I wanted to make sure you understood what it is. But if you ever see uh, someone playing Lady Macbeth who's doing a phenomenal job, this is a standout monologue. It's nearly, I think, perfectly paced and has just some very powerful, visceral language. And it's quite an introduction to a character. She's been on stage for like four minutes. Anyway, Macbeth enters. And one of the things I want to point out is he just returned from war. So he could have died. Who knows how long he's been away, at least a substantial amount of time. And this is the first time she's seen him. But notice her greeting for him. It goes right into great gloms worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. The all hail hereafter being the king. All hail Macbeth, right? So immediately greeted with his promotion and uh, what she believes he'll become. She says, Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in this instant. Macbeth says, My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. So he doesn't quite change the subject, but he, he says, You know, Duncan's coming. That could mean a few things. It could mean like we need to get ready, or it could mean like, what are we going to do with this knowledge that I'm supposed to be king, apparently, and now Duncan's going to be here? I think what Macbeth means is we need to get ready. I don't think his mind is quite on the murder like Lady Macbeth's is. Lady Macbeth says, and when goes hence tomorrow, as he proposes, oh, never shall sun that morrow see, meaning he will never see the sun tomorrow. Basically, the first time she says, let's kill Duncan tonight. And we get a stage direction there, Macbeth's reaction. And this is why I think he was not thinking of murder when he said, Duncan comes here tonight. Lady Macbeth says about his reaction, Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. So again, we see this theme that um, uh, happened earlier in the play when Malcolm was talking to Duncan, just in that last scene, one four, Malcolm's talking about the Thane of Cawdor being executed and he looked so remorseful. And Duncan says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. So that's pretty similar to your face, my Thane, is a book where men may read strange matters. Again, this idea of like controlling what's on your face so that others don't realize what's happening. And then she tells him what to do. She says, to beguile, now beguile means deceive, to beguile the time look like the time. So what that means is to trick people at this time, look like what time it is. And what time it is, is it's a party. The king's coming. It's a great celebration of victory. So basically look happy. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. So again, that you know uh, binary there, those opposites. Look like the flower, but be the serpent under it. Face looks like the flower. Thoughts are those of a serpent. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. So it's interesting, this language, you know, I'll take care of tonight, and everyone would have expected Lady Macbeth to take care of everything with the feast and all that. That was her role as a hostess, as a woman. But what she's actually talking about taking care of tonight is murdering the king. And when they do that, the rest of their nights and days will have solely sovereign sway and masterdom, basically meaning absolute power because they'll be king and queen. Macbeth just says, we will speak further. Lady Macbeth, only look up clear to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. So I'm going to take care of everything. To alter favor here means to alter your expression and um, to fear is like obviously to frighten. 
And uh, basically what she's saying is if you can keep your expression under control, there's nothing to be afraid of. I will take care of all of the rest. So we see this huge change in Lady, well, maybe not a huge change, but significant change in Lady Macbeth from theorizing and not even saying words like murder out loud using this sort of uncharged, ambiguous language to talk about her thoughts on this matter of, of Duncan being the king instead of Macbeth, going all the way to saying, I will take care of the murder and you know, calling on the devil for help and, and going through with it. And that's because the opportunity has presented itself. And she knows that if she doesn't do it now, she may never have a chance like this again. So she's going to plan on murdering Duncan. And yeah, like I said, it's a it's an introduction to the character for sure. Lady Macbeth is a, a famous character for many reasons, and this is one of them. Maybe a final note here. This play is called Macbeth. Usually that means, uh, you know, the title character speaks the most, except maybe in Julius Caesar, where he, uh, no spoilers, but he doesn't speak much, especially in the second act or second half of the play. But Macbeth has the most lines in this play by far. But at least in these early scenes, when Lady Macbeth's on stage, she outspeaks him by like four to one. If you look at this, Lady Macbeth has all these lines and Macbeth just says, uh, we will speak further. Uh, after that huge, uh, you know, how many lines is that? Almost 10, 12 lines. We will speak. He has half a line. And it's because Lady Macbeth has the power in these scenes. And that's so revolutionary for women at this time in Shakespeare's time. I mean, women couldn't even be on stage at Shakespeare's time. Men were playing women. And there are some definite, uh, you know, uh, as you like it, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Cleopatra, Antony and Cleopatra plays with big female characters, much ado. But, you know, Lady Macbeth, by comparison, is definitely the one that uh, is speaking about love, is speaking about power, and speaking about murder, and things that just weren't expected for women to speak of. And I think that's why it's the unsex me speech, throw off my womanhood and let me accomplish what no one thinks a woman at this time can accomplish. So maybe there's something to be commended there with Lady Macbeth. There's a reason people are drawn to her character, although the means by which she wants to achieve this power and uh, control of her own life is quite disturbing, to be sure. It's a really short scene, but there's actually some pretty important sort of I don't know, atmospheric notes to pick up on here. And it's a little contrary to where you might expect the play to be going. And of course, the characters that we have on stage, Duncan and Lady Macbeth, is a, um, let's see, it's, it's an interesting combination considering what uh, just took place in the last scene. So let's dive right in. Scene six, Duncan says, this is Macbeth's castle at Inverness. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. He's talking to Banquo, who says, This guest of summer, the temple-haunting marlet, and a marlet would be a, a marten, and a, a marten is a type of bird. So this guest of summer, the temple-haunting marlet, does approve by his loved masonry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. So basically, the bird really likes making its nest here, and it's a good sign. No juddy, frieze, buttress, nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle, where they most breed and haunt, I have observed, the air is delicate. So here we have a bird that is a good omen, which contrasts with the raven that we heard in the last scene with Lady Macbeth and her unsex me here speech. So these two lines I think are quite interesting, right? It's Duncan and Banquo's first impression of the castle. And based on this play, a play about murder, a play with witches, a play with, you know, sort of a, an evil or spooky reputation, right? The, the curse of the Scottish play, you don't even say the name of it in most theaters. You'd expect the castle to be scary. You'd expect Shakespeare to, or at least I would, expect Shakespeare to play up the spooky, frightening, terrifying atmosphere of everything going on. But here we get the exact opposite. I mean, look at the words here. Duncan says, the castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. According to Banquo, this bird, the marlet being there, shows heaven's breath smells wooingly here. And then at the end, he says, it's a sign that the air is delicate. So contrary to 
this being a terrifying place. It is a beautiful place. It smells nice, and they are expecting a grand party to celebrate victory, the end of a war, and a war that ended in victory for Duncan and his thanes. This should be an incredibly joyous occasion. But it's not, because we as the audience know what Lady Macbeth, especially Lady Macbeth, is plotting. And we'll talk about why Shakespeare creates this beautiful, idyllic setting for Inverness here. I think there's a really good point to it, but I don't want to get to it because I don't want to give anything away. So we'll just uh, bookmark it for another two scenes or so. Anyway, Lady Macbeth enters and talk about dramatic irony, where we know something that the characters on stage don't. We know Lady Macbeth wants to kill Duncan. Duncan obviously doesn't, or he wouldn't be there. Duncan says, see, see our honored hostess. The love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Herein I teach you how you shall bid God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. So basically, Duncan is giving a very elaborate and sort of high court thank you to Lady Macbeth for putting this all together. And he admits that it must have been incredibly you know, troublesome to have to do this. He's not pompous. He doesn't assume he can just waltz in anywhere and everyone has to bend to his will. He's incredibly grateful for what she's done. Now he can waltz in anywhere and he did. He just, he didn't get invited. He's just like, we're going to Inverness. Um, see you there. But he is at least very grateful of it. Lady Macbeth responds, all our service in every point twice done and then done double were poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. She's using very elaborate language here. Duncan's was elaborate. Hers is even more so. She says their service in every point twice done and then done double. So we got like some multiplication tables uh, up in this line here. But all of this, all of this is just because of how great Duncan is, their majesty. For those of old and late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. And this is a confusing phrase, but if you have the Folger edition with a side note or footnote, it tells you here, we rest your hermits means we remain your beadsmen. Beadsmen repaid gifts with prayers for the donor. So basically, she's praying and praising Duncan through this feast for all the great things that he's done for the country and by extension for her. So she's really putting on airs here as being very grateful for everything that's happening. And she is grateful that Duncan's there, but not for the reason that he thinks. Duncan says, where's the Thane of Cawdor, Macbeth? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, someone that goes before someone who's like noble, like a king. But he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him to his home before us. So again, we hear that Macbeth is really great at horseback riding. And Duncan says, well, he wanted to get home because he hasn't seen you. And so because of that, he beat us to the castle, even though we were going as fast as we could. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guest tonight. Lady Macbeth responds, your servants ever have theirs themselves, And what is theirs in compt? to make their audit at your highness's pleasure, still to return your own. And boy, is this a confusing line. So let's break it down slowly here. It means your servants, which is the Macbeths, Lady Macbeth especially, she's the one talking, your servants ever have theirs. Theirs means uh, their dependents, right? People, they depend on them. And what is theirs, what is their own, in compt, compt means trust. And here it means trust from the king. So everything we have, we have in trust from you because you are the king. And to make their audit at your highness's pleasure means whenever you want to, you can check and make sure that we are using what you have bestowed upon us properly, still to return your own. And this is very similar to, you know, some religious language here, like in the Bible, the parable of the, the talents, where different uh, servants are given different amounts of money, these talents. And when the master returns, he checks to see how they've used them. And the point of this is to say that, you know, we are blessed from God, but we should not just hoard our blessings to ourselves. We are meant to use them and spread them and grow goodness upon the world. And likewise, Lady Macbeth is, is making Duncan out to be a God who has blessed them and everything they have is from him. 
And to an extent, she's, you know, trying to put on airs and be overly affectionate and overly gracious toward him, probably to throw off any suspicion. But she's also right. Macbeth is the thane that he is, the new thane that he is, Cawdor, because of Duncan. Their wealth and status just doubled because of Duncan. Now, Duncan owes the Macbeths as well, or at least owes, well, both Macbeths. He owes Macbeth because he helped win the battle that saved him and his kingdom, and he owes Lady Macbeth because she is throwing together this entire huge ordeal to host him for the night. So it should be, like, pleasant. And this would be a boring, pleasant scene were it not for the scene before it. Duncan says, give me your hand, taking her hand, conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess, and they exit. So basically, Duncan says, show me where Macbeth is and we'll we'll go talk to him by your leave. And like I said, sometimes this can be, maybe I didn't say this, but sometimes this can be thought of as a bit of a, a throwaway scene. There's not a lot of action in it, but there is so much subtext. And with talented acting, it's incredible, right? You have Lady Macbeth just said she's going to kill Duncan. And then her and Duncan are on stage being pleasant to each other. And with acting and your internal motivations as an actor and how you can show those in subtle ways. This can be a fascinating, fascinating scene. There's a uh, production, it's a pretty popular one to watch in schools. The director is Rupert Gould or Gold. I don't know exactly how to say it. My apologies, Rupert. I also not entirely sure that's your first name. Most people know it as the Patrick Stewart version because Patrick Stewart is playing Macbeth. In this scene, I love watching this scene, uh, they do two really clever things. First off, they have witches in the background preparing the feast and the meal, and you don't really realize it's the witches until the end, so it gives this very creepy, haunting feel like they're always there. That's not in the script, but that's a cool added touch. And the other thing they do is they have little pockets where Lady Macbeth is looking at Duncan, but she's not listening to him. Her mind is elsewhere. And this is especially evident in the final line where he says, we love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him, which means take us to Macbeth. But then he keeps talking. So when they perform it, Duncan says that line and pauses. Lady Macbeth doesn't do anything. And then Duncan says, by your leave, hostess, like asking again. And then she still doesn't do anything and then realizes what's happened, laughs like, oh, I'm so absent-minded. And uh, she takes his arm and they walk off stage together. That is not in the play, like in the text itself. That's added in by the director and the actors. And it's wonderfully directed and wonderfully acted. But you don't pick up on any of that reading unless you're reading very carefully and reading with the idea of how would I stage this? And you don't have to be a director to ask that and ask and answer that question. You just have to think like, how would I view this as a, a TV show or a play? You know, it's a play. But if you're not familiar with plays, a TV show or a movie, how would I stage it? How would I make this interesting? And that subtext there makes for an incredibly interesting short little exchange there. So I think this is an incredibly important scene because of Duncan talking to Lady Macbeth and us getting to see that and see more of his character as a person, not just as a ruler. and those first lines, Duncan and Banquo, what uh, the Macbeth's castle is like and how it is so pleasant and uh, sweet smelling and seems to be blessed by heaven and the birds themselves. And in a couple of scenes, we'll see where things go from here. He says, if it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. What's really interesting about this first sentence is that we have four pronouns, it, or variations on it, it were, tis, twere, and it were again. And the it that Macbeth is referring to is the murder of Duncan, who is currently his house guest. He's unsure as to whether or not he should murder Duncan. Lady Macbeth is very sure that he should murder Duncan. But it's very interesting that it's non-specific language for this first line. Macbeth can't say the word murder quite yet, but he soon gets there. He says, if the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his Circe success, that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. But here upon this bank and shoal of time, 
we jump the life to come. This is quite a complicated sentence here. A few interesting things. First off, we have the word assassination, which is often attributed to Shakespeare in this scene as him being the creator, or at least the first person to use the word in print that still survives anyway. And assassination, of course, is a murder of a political or famous figure. So it's slightly different than just, um, I guess, normal murder, so to speak. It's more specific. So here we're talking about the murder of a king. Then we get all this sort of kind of like fishing language here. He says, trammel, a trammel is a net. So if killing, murdering Duncan, assassinating him, could with a net gather up all the consequences of that murder and catch with them the success that this murder might be the be all and end all, that everything would be done with this murder. You've probably heard that phrase before, be all, end all comes from this scene in Macbeth, might be the be all end all here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, bank near water, shoal is like a school of fish, we jump the life to come, meaning uh, the life to come is his soul, risk his soul. So basically what he's saying is he wishes that murdering Duncan would solve everything, but he knows, as anyone would know, that murdering someone doesn't solve anything, it just creates more problems. And for Macbeth, he realizes that the murder would be difficult, but what's really difficult is living with the murder. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught return to plague the inventor. So here he's kind of talking himself out of this. He, he kind of fantasizes or theorizes, if only when I murdered Duncan, it would solve all my problems. But he realizes in that very next sentence that when you teach bloody instructions, when you create bloodshed, it returns to plague the inventor. And plague is a very serious word in Shakespeare's time. Plague happened quite often. Eventually it shuts down all the theaters right after Shakespeare's career wraps up. The theaters get closed for a number of years due to the great plague of London. And Shakespeare's even born during a plague year. I mean, this is something that could come in and and visibly wipe out an entire village. So when a Shakespeare character uses the term plague, we understand that is a very significant and serious term. And basically he's saying that if I do this, it's going to come back and plague me. This even-handed justice, so fair judgment, commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips, meaning that when we poison someone, a chalice is a fancy cup, when we poison them with this cup, justice brings the cup back to our lips. So there's consequences for doing things like this. Even more reason not to do it. He says, he, meaning Duncan, is here in double trust. So two reasons that he should trust me. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, both strong against the deed, then as his host who should against his murder shut the door, not bear the knife myself. So the two reasons Duncan has to trust Macbeth First off, he's a fellow Scotsman and his subject, so his job is to serve the king. And secondly, he is his host. And if you were hosting someone at that time, just like I guess now, you'd be expected to provide them a safe spot to sleep. Your giant castle is to shut out murderers, Macbeth, not be the murderer yourself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels trumpet tongued meaning that duncan has had a great life he's been a good ruler and when he dies his virtues like angels on trumpets will plead against important word here the deep damnation of his taking off meaning that macbeth knows that killing duncan is is damning his own soul there's some theological things you could discuss in there about absolute sin but for our purposes macbeth realizes the severity of killing duncan that duncan will go to heaven and whoever kills him is not going to go to heaven and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast or heaven's cherubim Horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. Meaning that when he dies, the angels will sing and weep for his taking off, for his life. And in fact, this word here, uh, cherubim, can mean a number of things in the Bible. And oftentimes it's read as cherubs, which are like kind of the, the little baby angels, like with cute smiling faces. 
But as the uh, Folger edition here says, that this reference seems to be to the powerful supernatural winged creatures described in Ezekiel 10 and referred to in Psalm 1810, where God comes to the rescue of the psalmist David riding on a cherub. The quote from the Bible is, he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he came flying upon the wings of the wind. And you see that wind imagery and that flying imagery brought up. So what we have here is not just cute little baby angels crying for Duncan's death. The distinction is that God himself might intervene for Duncan, riding these powerful angels to save Duncan against whoever is going to murder him. And the resolve of this monologue, this final line is, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent. Again, we have horse riding imagery. A spur is what you use to make a horse move, I suppose. But only vaulting ambition, keyword here, which overleaps itself and falls on the other side is what he's going to say before he's cut off. So basically, I don't have any reason to make this horse go to take off Duncan's life and murder him. If I go for it and jump up on my horse, I'm going to jump too high and fall off on the other side and only hurt myself. So all of these reasons, right? He knows there's consequences for murdering Duncan. He knows that these consequences are going to come back to get him. He knows that there's reasons Duncan has to trust him and that he should honor that trust. And he knows that spiritually he is damning his soul by doing this. And at the end of this, he clearly says, I'm not going to murder Duncan. I have no resolve to do it. But then Lady Macbeth enters the scene. How now? What news? He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? Know you not he has. And then Macbeth says very clearly here, we will proceed no further in this business. Right? The business of murdering the king. We're not going to do it. And at this time, you know, women did not have a lot of power in a relationship or in society at all. So this should be the end of it here. That's not the case in this play. And it's one of the things that makes Lady Macbeth such an interesting character. Macbeth goes on to say, he, Duncan, hath honored me of late and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people. So, right, like he's been promoted golden opinions from all sorts of people, which should be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Being like, I should be happy. I should be celebrating, not throw away the things I just got to, you know, go on to the next thing. The next thing being killing the king. Notice that word worn, the opinions worn now. That's kind of the trigger for Lady Macbeth's line here. She says, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? So he said worn, she says dressed. You can see the kind of train of thought there. The hope being drunk is the hope of being king. And of course, if something is drunk, it's not true oftentimes. You know, alcohol causes people to maybe say things they don't mean or say things they don't want to be held to in the future. So basically being like, was that hope you had of being king? Was that just you like being drunk when you dressed yourself in that hope? Hath it, the hope, slept since and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? So were you, were you drunk when you were telling me you wanted to be king and your hope uh, fell asleep and woke up and now has a hangover when it used to want to be king, but now you have no hope for it? Like where, what's, what's this change coming from here? So she's really calling Macbeth out on his ambition right? When he writes that letter, when he thinks there's a possibility of becoming king, he's ambitious for it. He's hopeful for it. And Lady Macbeth is shocked and disgusted that that hope is evaporated so quickly. From this time, such I account thy love. And what that means is she is basically saying his love is fickle. Um, the such there is fickle, like his hope and resolution. Like she calls his love into question which is a, a pretty big card to play in a marriage, right? Art thou afeard to be the same in thy own act and valor as thou art in desire? So why are you afraid to do what you desire to do? Wouldest thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life and live a coward in thy own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. And that last line there, the cat in the adage is a proverb where there's a cat who wants a fish and sees the fish like in the water, but it's afraid of getting its paws wet. So Lady Macbeth is being like, oh, his little pussycat afraid to get his paws wet. And, you know, she's really kind of digging in at Macbeth here. And this is someone who cut someone open at the beginning of the play to save his country, right? This is a war hero. And she's saying, are you afraid to get your paws wet? Yeah, it's, it's a low blow. 
Macbeth says, prithee peace, meaning silence. I dare do all that may become a man who dares do more is none. That's an important line here. Some context with it. There was this thing that people sort of adhered to in Shakespeare's time called the hierarchy of creation. And basically in that you have three levels of creation. You have the beings of heaven on top. In the middle, you have humans. And on the very bottom, you have animals. So what he's saying is, I dare do all that a man, a human can do. If I do more, I will not be a human. I will be a beast. And Lady Macbeth picks up on that in her next line. She says, what beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? Breaking enterprise means tell me about your plans. When you durst to do it, then you were a man. So when you told me about this, that's when you were being a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. So if we remember that hierarchy, she's saying when you had hope, that's when you were a man. Beasts don't have hope. Men have hope. That's when you're a man. And if you do more, you'll be more than a man. And you'd think like, how would a human be like a being of heaven? Well, in the medieval times and up until Shakespeare's time, there was something called the divine right of kings where, you know, rulers told their subjects that God had made them the ruler. So being more than a man would be like being a king almost of heaven. That, of course, was a very convenient way to avoid things like assassination or rebellion by saying, oh, God made me in charge, so you have to listen to me. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. So you did not have an opportunity to kill Duncan, and yet you now do. They have made themselves and that their fitness now does unmake you. Their fitness is their convenience, right? You have the chance. This is your only chance and you're going to throw it away. Then we get this line, which is even to a modern audience with all our gratuitous media, this is still just an incredibly shocking and eye-opening line. It's one as a teacher, I always have to make sure that I'm reading this line when we read out loud in class so a poor student doesn't have to read it out loud. She says, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. So basically meaning Lady Macbeth is breastfed, which means that she has given birth. The Macbeths had a child at one point. That child is not in the play. So unfortunately, a sad reality of life and a reality that was far too common at this time was losing a child early in life, which we're led to believe the Macbeths have done. She says about that child, I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. Now that is a metaphor. Basically, what you are doing to me would be the equivalent of killing that child, throwing it on the ground and destroying it. So there is a lot to unpack there. When we're talking about the psychology of these characters, they've gone through perhaps the most traumatic thing you could ever go through in your life, the loss of a child. Macbeth has also just gone through war, a brutal and bloody war. And uh, they've been apart from each other, which must have been very stressful as well. So a lot of things are converging here. And they're not in their best, healthiest spot is what I'm saying. And I think that's why what begins to unfold begins to unfold. Macbeth says, if we should fail, and look, he's cut off like just four syllables in, um, which again, women were not even allowed on stage at this time, let alone given a lot of lines in most plays. So the fact that Lady Macbeth is out speaking him so much is so significant. And remember, in her first scene, she says, unsex me, make me more like a man, throw off my womanhood so I can do what society only allows men to do, which is, you know get what they want from life. If we should fail, we fail, but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. That's like a reference to a crossbow, like you turn a screw to tighten a crossbow. We think, no one's entirely sure. When Duncan is asleep, so here's the plan. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, so he's gonna sleep soundly, his two chamber lanes, which are his guards, Will I with wine and way sail so convince that memory, the wanderer of the brain, shall be a fume 
So their memories will, because they'll be drunk and tired, their memories will be like smoke, a fume, and the receipt of reason, a limbeck only. And a limbeck is like a distilling, like something you used to use in distilling, so creating vapor. When in swinish sleep, swinish, so beastly sleep, their drenched natures lies as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Quell means murder. So basically the plan is for Lady Macbeth to get the guards drunk and set things up in a way so that when they kill Duncan, they can easily pin it on the guards. And, um... You know, there's no fingerprinting or DNA testing or any like high tech detective work at this time. And Macbeth sees it as a convincing plan. He says, bring forth men, children only, which is a bit of a funny line. For thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males being like, you are so incredible. You are only going to birth men, um, <laughs> which again um, is funny to me as a modern man, I guess it's not very funny. In the context of the play, it's very sexist, right? That they would want a male child as opposed to a female child. But this is particularly important to rulers, right? Henry VIII, anyone? And um, this is our first clue that Macbeth is deciding he's going to become king. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and used their very daggers that they have done it? Yeah, basically, your plan's going to work. Who dares receive it other, so whoever questions it, as we shall make our grieves and clamor roar upon his death. And here we have an interesting little acting within acting. Lady Macbeth says, we're going to be so good at acting that even if someone doesn't think the guards did it, they certainly won't think we did it based on our performance. And it's interesting that you see this in Hamlet as well. Shakespeare is really an actor's playwright because he understood acting and the way his theater company was set up. He probably did some of the acting himself or at least worked so closely with the actors that oftentimes his lead characters are good actors. Like the characters themselves are good actors, um, whether it be the Macbeths here or in the future, or um, like I said, Hamlet with his um, antic disposition, pretending to be crazy. Final line here, Macbeth says, I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. So corporal agent is every part of my body is uh, going to work toward this, basically. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. And that line has been echoed so many times throughout this play. If you jump back to Lady Macbeth tells Macbeth when they first talk about this plan in scene six, um, no, I'm sorry, scene five. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. And then earlier in the play as well, we have Duncan in 1-4 says to Malcolm, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. So this theme that you cannot trust what's on someone's face to accurately portray what's in their heart, or that you can use your face as a way to get what you want by hiding your true desires comes up over and over again. And we see a lot of major themes in this scene. We see themes of ambition. We see themes of alcohol. We see themes of sleep, animals, all sorts of stuff that shows up over and over again in the play. So those are great things to latch onto and a really wonderful sort of thing to look for as you're reading. But the biggest theme, of course, is that Macbeth went from starting the play I'm sorry, starting the scene with, uh, we are not doing this. I have no resolve. I have no ambition uh, or no spur to prick the side of my intent to let's do this. And what's convinced him is Lady Macbeth. So I hope that was helpful for you and uh, you're able to make sense of it all. But yeah, that's the first act of Macbeth. And if you're able to follow the first act, it only gets easier and easier as you know the characters. Um, so thank you so much for watching. And if you, uh, again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and happy reading.